How do you say that name? I really want to understand how to say that name. Okay, guys. So we're going to be going into the PACU. What happens in the post-operative PACU? We're going to do the little quick and dirty here. So how long does a patient stay in the PACU? And really, what we're looking for in the PACU areas. So you guys remember the top three reasons people go to the OR is cardiac surgery. The main thing they're going to the OR for is, um, you know, let's um, a coronary artery bypass surgery. That's really the main thing for cardiacs. Uh, if they're going to the OR for, let's just say, uh, uh, any type of bone, um, the main one for a bone is old grandma breaks her hip. And we do an ORF. A, um, uh, basically, we're just doing a fixation. We're putting the screws in that side of the hip, and we, that's what we're doing in the OR. And the third main thing people go to the OR for is something called a small bowel obstruction. And really, the doctor, the gastroenterologist, is just the plumber. And all he's doing is taking out that piece of plumbing, cutting it, and reattaching the plumbing. And hopefully the patient uh, doesn't have any more backup of plumbing issues, okay? So what do we need to do in the, in the PACU to make sure our patient is safe. PACU is our after surgery. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense a little bit. So we already did our pre-surgery. So they we've done the pre. They've already had the surgery. So we did the one, the two. And now we are post-surgery here. We are all done with the surgery, and the patient should be doing a little bit better. So, I have a little report here for PACU patients. So the anesthesiologist, the, um, the sleepy doctor, or the, anesthesia, uh, the nurse anesthetist, and you guys can be actually nurse anesthetists as a RN and they get paid like $150,000 to $200,000 a year, which is insane to me, because all they do is they just put an ET tube down in the patient's trachea and monitoring the breathing of the patient during the, um, the operating process. So, I mean, they do have a big job. They're controlled of keeping the patient um, um, asleep through anesthesia, but... Um, they have a kind of chill job, just kick back kind of. So, in the PACU, the anesthesiologist uh, or the anesthesiologist tells you what kind of anesthesia was given. That's number one. What has suppressed our central nervous system, right? What has caused us to go to sleep and drool all over the place? And we know that whatever it was is going to slow down our heart because that's a part of our central nervous system. It's going to slow down our breathing. That's a part of our central nervous system. It's going to slow down our GI motility because that's a part of our central nervous system. That peristalsis, not peristalsis, I forget the name of it, but that, that natural movement of our GI tract. Okay? So, we know that anesthesia equals your central nervous system depressed, okay? So your heart's going to go down, your lungs are going to go down, and your GI tract is going to go down. Also, we want to know estimated blood loss. How much blood was lost from the patient during this OR? Lastly, we want to know is how much fluids were input and output of the OR, okay? And let's see here. Okay, cool. And basically we want to know 
how the patient is doing in terms of their lab values with their estimated blood loss. If we lost too much blood, we don't want our patient to bleed out. And um, say we didn't lose a lot of blood, but um, the patient's bleeding profusely, we want to check our PTT, your INR, your um, PT, all about your coagulation, okay? So, those are some things that we want to know first off before we start taking care of our patient. Now, we know those things, okay? Then we're going to be taking a look at our patient itself. So let's talk about some physical assessment findings with our patient, okay? So how does our patient look? What's the first thing you're going to do, the very, very first thing you're going to do with the post-op patient? What are you going to do? So hopefully, everyone always gets this wrong, but your first priority is obviously ABCs, airway breathing circulation. If your patient's not breathing, then it doesn't matter if your patient is hemorrhaging out of their um, you know, incision site. It doesn't matter. Because if your patient's not breathing, your patient's pretty much dead. And who cares if the hemorrhaging of the incision site is profusely bleeding or whatever, if your patient's not breathing, guys, he's dead, okay? So that's the first one, airway and breathing, making sure that we have an airway and the patient's breathing because that anesthesia is decompressing our central nervous system. The third thing, guys, is our circulation. So with our patient, our surgery site is really just next. So our surgery site is the next thing here. So how does the site look? Are we having um, you know, profuse bleeding? Um, if, okay, so the pa let's just say you received a patient from the PACU, okay? Because this is how most nursing tests really are. You're, you're never a PACU nurse or a post, right immediately post-operative nurse because the patients stay in this PACU area for maybe about one day or 12 hours. It just really depends on what kind of surgery they had. Then the patient's going to be going to the med surge unit. If it was cardiac related, they're probably going to go to the ICU. And then they'll have a Swan's catheter, which measures the cardiac output. And that's like fourth semester stuff. If you're going to do like a basic like knee surgery, they'll probably be out of the PACU within like six hours. And uh, they're going to be on the med surge floor. So assess, assess, assess the surgery site, okay? So data action response. This is your nursing process here. What is the data? Are you assessing the patient? So here's some basic assessments. You're going to look at the surgery site. Is there bleeding? No one is supposed to remove that initial dressing after surgery. Only the doctor. But you can call the doctor and say, hey doc, the site is bleeding. I outlined it with a pen at the beginning of the shift or when my patient was admitted to our med surge floor. Now, the entire site dressing is just soaked. What do I do? That's when the doctor wants to be called, okay? If you have a soaking of the surgical site itself, that, that initial dressing, call the doctor, okay? Um, let me see here. So is the site bleeding? Now, if it's been like, let's say, two days after post-op, and let's say um, the doctor's come in, taken off the bandage, everything looks good, that second day, you should assess the site for infection, okay? Now, what do we know about infection? What does infection look like? Well, 
Is it warm? Basically, those mast cells in the in the um, in the incision itself is opening up circulation, and uh, there's a war going on between our white blood cells and the infection itself. So if there's a warmth on the actual incision site, you can just put your fingers there and feel it. Is it warm? Is it red? Is there any type of drainage coming out, like pus? That's not good. You want the actual like bed of the wound to be clean, dry, and um, look pink. We call it just clean, dry, and intact. That's what we call when, when a, um, an actual dressing itself is clean, dry, and intact, or an actual wound in and of itself is you know cool to touch, dry, pink, um, wound bed. Those are all good stuff. That means your patient's getting better, and we're actually doing good nursing. But it's up to you, the nurse, to figure out that with your assessment skills, your critical thinking skills, right? All, all it really is is just looking at the site and saying, is it warm? Does it look like there's an infection? It's really, really simple, okay? So don't get scared. Um, another thing with infection, does the patient have a fever? How are the vital signs? If the patient has a fever, that means their heart rate will be skyrocketed as well, if it's a bad fever. If you take your patient's um, temperature and it's not really, let's say it's like 99.4, kind of like low, it's not, it's not too bad, um, but the patient's heart rate is like in the 120s, 130s, and you're like, hmm, what's going on here? You guys want to make sure that um, your patient doesn't have any signs and symptoms of extended fever. That can be an infection as well. So body temperature, guys. Um, sight. We can do, let's see here, your CMS. So sight, CMS, uh, let's see here, your LOC, and your pain. So I'm right about two more minutes and then I'm going to stop this video. But the first thing you guys want to assess for your patient is obviously ABCs first, then their level of consciousness, then you're going to assess the site itself. Is it bleeding or is it infected and how do we know? If it's a knee or um, extremity surgery, we want to make sure to assess our circulation, motor, and sensory. Basically, a cap refill. Is blood actually returning to the distal portions of the body? If it is, good. If it's not, then we might have something called compartmental syndrome. A fancy words for there's probably a increase in blood just to, due to like too much inflammation from let's say like a total knee replacement. There's like way too much inflammation and it's not letting the blood get down to the toes, to the little toesies, you know? So we check for circulation. We check for motor. Is the patient able to move their toes? Pretty simple. If they're not, then we might have a decrease in circulation. And sensation. Are they able to feel um, your, your touch? If they're not able to feel your touch, then that can be indicative of decreased circulation as well. Hypoperfusion. And your patient just has an inflamed knee and there's no circulation getting down there. So that means that if that continues and you're not a good nurse and you're not assessing with our data, we're not going to be able to do an action and the response is your patient might lose their foot because no oxygen is getting down to those toes. So do good assessments, guys. For your pain, is the patient in pain and how do you know? Obviously, you can ask them. If they're having trouble talking to you because of all the uh, 
the pain meds, right? And they're drooling on themselves. Then make sure that you're assessing your patient's level of consciousness, okay? Because sometimes they can overdo it on their patient-controlled analgesic, and um, they can cause them to be like really decompressed in their brain, and that's decompressing the heart, the lungs, and the GI, which is not good because um, I've never seen anyone OD or overdose on a, a P PCA pump, patient-controlled analgesic pump, but uh, you want to make sure that your patient is not getting too much of uh, the, um, the, uh, the pain meds. So that's your initial assessment, guys. Let's talk about your ongoing assessment for your patient out of the um, OR. So let's do that right here. Woo! Oh, man.